Hi, this is Dr. Mariam Abdullah, a specialist in orthodontics. And I'm going to share my screen now. Um, today's talk is going to be about class one malocclusion. Uh, this is our first lecture in our theoretical course, and we have to start with the intended learning outcomes. In general, it's to obtain knowledge of the features and etiology of the various types of malocclusions, demonstrate knowledge of the different aspects of treatment of each type of malocclusions, recognize and evaluate the main benefits and risks of orthodontic treatment, acquire a sound clinical judgment of orthodontic problems, diagnose and manage emergencies related to orthodontic patients, demonstrate a thorough knowledge of the basics of orthodontics, implement the theoretical knowledge with the clinical decisions, process letters of referral to prioritize appointments and liaise with orthodontists, differentiate between simple cases and those which require referral to specialists, identify the orthodontic role in multidisciplinary team. Right, and um, of course, these will be provided to you with your course syllabus, as well as with the list of lectures and this is on your e-learning website. Our references is Laura Mitchell, fifth edition and introduction to orthodontics, our textbook, chapter eight, 12 and 13. Don't worry, each is like 10 to maybe 15 pages or, or even less, okay? So for class one malocclusion, we're gonna go through some definitions to remind you with uh, different terminologies etiology of class one malocclusion as well as occlusal features how to write problem list how to come up with treatment objectives and what treatment plans we have for this malocclusion and some special cases related to this type of malocclusion now we're going to start with something called the class one occlusion not malocclusion occlusion uh, and this is when the anterior posterior relationship is within average and there is no or minimal occlusal abnormalities within the arches. If this is the case, then this is considered a normal occlusion. A normal occlusion actually accounts for about 35% of the population. The rest, 65% of the population, will have a certain sort of malocclusion. So this is an example of a patient with the class one incisors, class one molders and canines. This is a class one occlusion where we have no or minimal disturbances within the occlusion. On the other hand, class one malocclusion is when the anterior posterior relationship is still within normal, but the problem lies within the arches themselves or when we have transverse or vertical discrepancies uh, between the arches or within the skeletal pattern. And this accounts for 60% of all malocclusions. That means the majority of malocclusions in the population is actually categorized as class one. And to continue with the definition, class one incisor relationship is when the lower incisal edge occludes at or immediately below the single and plateau of the upper incisors. To be specific, upper central incisors, according to the British Standard Institutes in the 1983. The buccal segment relationship is classified as class one when the mesobuccal cusp of the upper first molar occludes at the buccal groove of the lower first molar. So this is a class one. Canine relationship is class one when the cusp tip of the upper canine occludes within the embrasure of the lower, uh, between the lower canine and first premolar. So this is class one canine relationship. So this is an example where the patient actually has the lower incisal edge occludes at the single plateau of the upper incisors. So by definition, this is a class one. And I know here that you could see more than one shadow, but we're going to take the most protruded one. I'm going to show you the lower incisor photos now. And you're going to see that some of the incisors, namely the lateral incisors are lingually and the centrals are labially. So we're going to take the centrals. So the lower incisors actually occludes at the single plateau of the upper. So by definition, this is a class 
one inside the relationship. If you look at the same patient intraorally, we have class one molars, both sides, class one canines, both sides, but and, and a class one incisors. But I cannot classify this as a class one occlusion because we have crowding, multiple rotation, by maxillary proclination. So this is what we call class one malocclusion because we have abnormalities other than the anterior posterior dimension. Right? Now we will come to the etiology of a class one malocclusion. If we talk about the etiology of any malocclusion, we have to go through the skeletal, soft tissue, dental factors in this order. For a class one malocclusion, the skeletal factors in the anterior posterior dimension is usually minimal. It's rarely an etiology because usually the anterior posterior relationship is normal, it's class one. We might have some cases where we have mild class two or mild class three skeletal pattern. In cases where we have mild class 2, usually we will have dentoalveolar compensation to camouflage the underlying skeletal pattern. So the lower incisor is usually procline to bring the lower incisal edge to occlude within the single umbilical of the upper. So we still call it class 1 malocclusion, although the skeletal pattern is mild class 2. If the opposite, if we have class 3 skeletal pattern and it's mild, and the patient is having favorable soft tissues to carry out the dental alveolar compensation, usually what happens is that the upper incisors will procline, maybe plus minus the lower incisors will retrocline in order to camouflage the underlying skeletal pattern. So this is an example of a patient with class one uh, skeletal pattern and class one malocclusion. Let's see the example here. Another example where the patient is actually having class two skeletal pattern, but yet the lower incisal edge occludes at the single and plateau. How come? Well, because we have into other compensation where, where the lower incisors actually proclined in order to camouflage the underlying skeletal pattern. The opposite is true as well. So this patient is having class three skeletal pattern. And yet, if we look, we will find that the lower incisors are actually occluding, the, uh, the lower incisal edge occludes at the single umbilical of the upper incisor. So by definition, this is a class one malocclusion where we have mild class three skeletal pattern. So th this is just to show you the class one incisor relationship. So again, this is a patient with a class one skeletal and class one incisor relationship. When we have mild class two, what happens is that the lower incisors will procline in order to camouflage the underlying skeletal uh, discrepancy. Class three skeletal pattern, usually the upper incisors will procline plus minus the lower incisor might retrocline in order to get a class one incisor relationship. Uh, on the other hand, in the vertical dimension, we might have some discrepancies. And usually vertically, we usually have increased lower facial height, for example, with serial growth rotation, and we end up with reduced overbite or anterior overbite. Also, in the, in the transverse dimension, we might have facial asymmetry associated usually with the cross bites. So this is an example of a patient where the lower incisal edge occludes immediately below the single and plateau of the upper incisors. So this is a class one incisor relationship by definition. And yet the patient is having anterior open bite. So this is a class one malocclusion complicated by anterior open bite and by maxillary proclination as well. What about facial growth? Could facial growth be, could be could this be part of the etiology? Well, rarely. It could rarely contribute to the etiology of a class one malocclusion. In the anterior posterior dimension, usually it's favorable. And if there was any continue, continuous growth within the class two uh, pattern or class three pattern, we will still have dental, dental liver compensation in order to camouflage it. But in the vertical dimension, if the patient is having tendency of increased lower facial height and the patient is still growing, most probably this will get worse because the vertical compensation has a limit as well as vertical dental alveolar growth has a limit as well. It cannot 
usually accommodate the further uh, facial growth and we will end up with an anterior open bite. Now, what about the mandibular position or path of closure? Could this contribute to the malocclusion? Yes, especially if we have uh, anterior crossbite like instanding incisors or unilateral buccal crossbite. Instanding incisors are sometimes associated with anterior mandibular displacement. Unilateral crossbite usually associated with uh, lateral mandibular displacement with facial asymmetry. So this could be part of the etiology of a class one malocclusion. What about soft tissues? Again, they could rarely contribute to the etiology of class one malocclusion, but we have two specific cases where it clearly is the etiological factor. First, patients with flaccid, everted, um, low tenacity lips. Usually this will affect the neutral zone where the, where the labial segments are actually uh, positioned. So we will have the tongue actually winning over those weak lips and we will end up with proclination of both upper and lower labial segments. So patients with bimaxillary proclination are usually having unfavorable soft tissue. So soft tissues could be part of the etiology. And as well as low upper frenal attachment like this, and we will end up with diastema. So what's the etiology of this diastema? Soft tissues. What's the etiology of bimaxillary proclination for this patient? Again, soft tissues. Otherwise, majority of the cases for class one malocclusion, soft tissues will contribute to dental alveolar compensation and usually they are favorable. So this is an example of a patient with flaccid lips, diverted. As you can see here, the mentalis muscle is actually uh, active because the patient is making an effort with her incompetent lips and she ends up with having class 1 malocclusion complicated by bimaxillary proclination. What about the last etiological factor, dental factor? Well, actually, this is the major contributing factors in class 1 malocclusion. Um, mainly, tooth size arch length discrepancy with crowding. This is the major factor and the major features that you could see in patients with a class one malocclusion. Environmental factors can lead to crowding and spacing, as well as local factors. For example, early loss of deciduous teeth, um, you might end up with impaction, severely displaced teeth, anomalies related to number of teeth like hypodontia supernumeraries or form of teeth. All these could contribute to the dental factors uh, producing class one malocclusion. So this is a patient where we have beautiful profile, class one skeletal pattern, vertical dimension is within average, class one incisor relationship, uh, class one molar relationship, but the problem, and uh, as well as class one actually uh, canine relationship. But we have local factors, we have dental factors contributing to localized cross bites on the, in the premolar area, as well as multiple rotations and some crowding. So how do we classify this? Class one mal occlusion. What is the main etiological factor? Not skeletal, not soft tissue. This is dental factors, local factors. Now we finished with the etiology. Now we're going to talk about the main features that we could actually spot with patients with a class one mal occlusion. It's almost a repetition of the etiological factors. So usually the incisor relationship, well, actually it's not usually, it must be class one. Otherwise we wouldn't classify it as a class one malocclusion. So the incisors should be class one. Um, but it doesn't have to be the ideal class one. We might end up with a class one incisor relationship with anterior open bite or with some teeth in cross bite. Uh, sometimes reduced over overbite. Patients with bimaxillary proclination could have class one incisor relationship with increased over jet and reduced overbite. So although we will have we we must have class one incisor relationship, but it's not the ideal. So this is the example of a patient with a class one incisor relationship, class one mal occlusion, but complicated by bimaxillary proclination as well as anterior open bite. Uh, as a general rule, to be able to classify this as a class one, 
we need to have at least two upper incisors in class one relationship and other occlusal features compatible with the class one occlusion. Uh, in this case, we classify it as class one malocclusion. Usually in class one malocclusion, the buccal segment relationship is usually class one, but sometimes we have some local factors that could disturb this relationship. For example, early loss of deciduous teeth or crowded canines. So if you have crowded canines, this will lead in, for example, in the upper arch, this will lead to mesial movement of the rest of the buccal segment. So you will lose your beautiful class one molar relationship and you will end up with a class two-ish molar relationship. So this is an example of a patient on the right side, no crown area crowding. So we have class one molar relationship and here we have some molar area crowding on the left side. So we end up with a class two molar relationship and buccal segment relationship. This is another example where the patient is having class one inside the relationship, but when we look at the molars, they're actually class three. And if we look carefully, what's the etiology of having class three molar relationship when the malocclusion is classified as a class one? Here we have local factors. There is an early loss of ease in the lower arch and the first permanent molars moved measly and we ended up with impacted lower second premolars and the molar relationship was disturbed. So instead of having class one, we have class three because the molars in the lower moved forward as a result of an early loss of E. So this is a local factor leading to a disturbance of the molar relationship. So after you examine your patient and you fill your personal information for the patient, extraoral, intraoral examination and features of the occlusion, we move to space condition and alignment. After that, anything that you have from your examination form that deviates from the average and deviates from normal, you have to list down and you have to address within your problem list. We usually start with non-orthodontic problems and this usually include the, uh, let's say, uh, plaque accumulation, active caries, periodontal problems, etc. And then we move to list our problem list based on the skeletal soft tissue dental uh, factors so that you actually don't forget uh, any uh, important feature. Usually on the skeletal pattern, until posteriorly most of the class one malocclusions, they have it normal, but you might have some vertical or transverse discrepancies. Again, soft tissues usually it's favorable unless you have bimax with flaccid lips as we talked about or low upper frenal attachment. Dentally here you will have lots of things to talk about as we said crowding, hypodontia, rotation, impaction, etc, uh, etc. Et After you finish your problem list, everything on your problem list you have to address within your treatment objectives. And again, we always start with our non-orthodontic problems. We treat the non-orthodontic problems and then we move on to other problems. So we need to manage the non-orthodontic problems to stabilize any active dental disease. And then we move to, for example, relief crowding, align and level, because the most important problems in class one malocclusion, most commonly it's crowding. Correct or retain overbite because again, overbite is usually average. Uh, correct crossbite and eliminate any mandibular displacement, and that would include anterior or posterior crossbite. And of course, correct central line shift related to mandibular displacement to the lateral, uh, right or left lateral side. Correct or retain or overjet again, it depends on the case. Correct or retain molar and canine relationship to class one and I close any residual spaces. So this is usually, usually our classical treatment objectives for a class one malocclusion. For example, if you have an anterior open bite, then you might uh, move this uh, further up because it's more important. If you have an active cross bite with mandibular displacement, you might give it a priority and move it up uh, your priority list in order to treat first. After you finish your treatment objectives, you actually move to your treatment plan. You need to decide if this case will require extraction, non-extraction, and you need to decide on your own the type of appliance. 
anchorage focal segment relationship at the end of your uh, treatment and the retention for the case. Usually in class one malocclusions, we really, really need to consider treat or not to treat at all. Uh, extract or not to extract is an important decision and what type of appliance we have. When do we consider no treatment? Well, first, if the case is too mild, so if the patient is having class one malocclusion with mild crowding, for example, um, or mild spacing, then maybe we need to uh, offer no treatment because we need to look at benefits and risks. Uh, and if risks are uh, outweigh the benefits that you provide, then maybe we should offer no treatment. If the patient is satisfied with the aesthetic and function, then again, we offer no treatment. Uh, if the patient is not cooperative and refuses your treatment, of course, again, we depend on patient compliance. So if he's not complying, we don't offer treatment. Or if the patient is not maintaining good oral hygiene, and this applies to all types of malocclusions. Now, in the majority of cases, the only feature of malocclusion to be treated usually usually crowding. Now, this could be treated without any use of appliance, and this is what we call timely extraction and spontaneous tooth movement. Or we can treat with space maintainers, or we can have a full course of orthodontic treatment with removable or fixed appliances. Now, how do we decide if this case could be corrected with removable or with fixed appliances? Well, it depends. If the tooth angulation at the start of the treatment is favorable for simple tipping movement, then we might just use simple removable appliance. If tipping movement will do the job, again, we use removable appliance. If the problem is only in the upper arch, then removable appliance is a good choice. Fixed orthodontic appliance, on the other hand, is good if we have multiple tooth movement required for treatment, especially due rotations and bodily movements. If both arches are involved, that both of them need uh, treatment. If, if rotations is important to be corrected, this could not be actually treated with removable. We need fixed orthodontic appliance. Now we come to special cases that requires uh, uh, orthodontic treatment and they are categorized as class one malocclusion. We're gonna start with crowding. Uh, in general, and we're going to give um, good attention to a special case called late lower incisor crowding. Spacing and the, and the rest of the uh, list, we were going to discuss it in our uh, next lecture. So, in general, space, uh, generally talking, uh, the crowding is usually a tooth side arch link discrepancy. And it, uh, if we say a discrepancy, this could be associated with uh, positive finding, so this is spacing, or negative results, and this is crowding. And usually it is associated with tooth size arch-link discrepancy, generalized problem, or it could be localized as a result of local factors like early loss of a deciduous tooth. 60% of the Caucasian children will have a certain degree of crowding. This could be inherited, you know, something runs in the family. It could be environmental related to caries, early loss of deciduous teeth, or it could be due to the modern diet that is soft compared with the uh, old diet. And this will uh, produce lack of attrition within the contact points, and we will have more crowding or changes with aging, such as late lower incisor crowding. How do we calculate or the space and we carry out the space analysis? As you already know, we calculate space available within the arch. And then this is minus a space required, which is the, uh, the mesodistal width of a permanent teeth required to be aligned. And then the result, as we said, could be positive, which means spacing, or it could be negative, which means crowding. According to Laura Mitchell, less than four millimeters of crowding is considered mild crowding. Four to eight millimeters is considered moderate crowding. More than eight millimeters is considered severe crowding. Uh, this is how a space analysis is carried out. Now, if we have mild crowding, most probably we go non-extraction. Very specific cases, we might extract second molar, but in the majority of cases, we go non-extraction. 
Four to eight millimeters, which is the moderate crowding, these are usually borderline cases. So we could go non-extraction and use other methods to provide space like distalization of the molars in the upper arch, uh, expansion, proclination of the labia segment, uh, expansion, for example, interdental stripping, derotation of posterior teeth. All these are methods that could be used to provide space. Or we could extract premolars if necessary. It depends on each individual case. In severe crowding, not only extraction is necessary, but also we need to reinforce anchorage. This is, of course, just a general guideline. This is not a rule. Just a general guideline. So it doesn't mean that every patient with moderate crowding, you have to go for extraction. It depends on the case. So this is an example of a patient with a class one malocclusion complicated by mild crowding in the upper and the lower arch. So most probably we will need no extraction, just fixed appliance to align and level, derotate teeth, settle teeth to class one occlusion. So this is a case of non-extraction. Moderate crowding for this patient, this is a borderline case where we could go extraction or non-extraction. But because the upper and the lower labial segment, as it's clearly seen from this picture, they are proclined. So the decision was made to extract four premolars, one premolar in each quadrant. Fixed appliance, align and level, arch coordinate, and we end up with a class one occlusion. Now, severe crowding, not only extraction is necessary, but also reinforcement of anchorage. By the way, reinforced anchorage means that you're going to use headgear, mini sprues, um, a special uh, anchorage device that we use uh, to reinforce anchorage, a transpalatal arch, lingual arch, for example, and other devices that we could use. For this patient, we had four premolars extracted, transpalatal arch used, line and level, uh, center line uh, correction, and we ended up with a class one occlusion. So this is a case of severe crowding. Now, what about what we call late lower incisor crowding? Well, late lower incisor crowding usually uh, occur between the ages of, let's say, 18 to 22. What happens is that suddenly the lower incisors will start to get crowded. And the, the exact etiology is not really well known. So there are a number of theories. For example, uh, between 18 and 22, we, we, we will have residual growth. Uh, and it's not as fast or as um, huge as the growth spurt uh, that happens between 10 and 12 for uh, girls and 12 to 14 for boys. No, it actually happens uh, late between 18 and 22. And usually it follows the same pattern of cephalocaudal gradient of growth. And we will have the mandible growing a little bit further than the maxilla. So this will push the lower incisors forward against the upper incisors. And we will end up with retroclination and occupying smaller arch and having crowding. Uh, the other theory is mesial migration of the posterior teeth due to the mesial vector forces of uh, during mastication and occlusion. This could push the teeth forward. Um, the uh, presence of uh, third molars, just simply they are sitting there. Uh, this is the passive rule, just sitting there. Passive rule is to prevent, uh, is actually sometimes preventing uh, vectors of forces from distributing distally. And this could contribute to the crowding. This is what the theory is saying or the active rule where the third molars are erupting and they are pushing against the rest of the arch. Mm -hmm. These are only theories, uh, nothing has proved yet. And actually there was one of the randomized clinical trials that was carried out in the 1990s. And what they did was they randomly allocated patients within that age in between uh, extraction of wisdoms and the other group was non-extraction of wisdoms and actually what happens is that both groups suffered the same extent of late lower incisor crowding so it seems that the eruption of wisdoms is just coincident it's not a cause effect relationship with the late lower incisor crowding in other words there is no uh, reason to extract the wisdoms in order to stop or prevent 
late lower incisor lesion. There is no evidence. So uh, you could keep, if it's mild, just accept. If it's moderate or severe, then you might consider proclination of incisors, intertender stripping, and sometimes if it's severe enough, you could go for extraction of one of the incisors that is severely displaced. But it's important to know that if you extract an incisor in, in the lower labia segment, overbite and overjet will increase. So this is good for class three cases, class three malocclusion, but not for class one, not for class two. So it's important when you decide your extraction to look at the overall malocclusion. So this is an example of a patient who suffered lower inside, late lower incisor crowding, and he, he came to our clinic seeking treatment. Luckily, the overjet is enough to accommodate this tooth again within the line of the R. So we went for expansion, providing space and just align that to the bring it out within the line of the arch. Non-extraction, not even interdental stripping, nothing. Another case here also mild, well actually this is moderate crowding in the lower labial segment. Um, we went for a partial fix, so we didn't have to bond all teeth partial fix because the crowding was generalized. So we didn't have to go for space opening or expansion for a specific area. So it was easier to go with partial fixed uh, orthodontic appliance, align and level, and that's it. OK. Now, sometimes we could go for extraction of teeth and expect some spontaneous favorable tooth movement. A very important a uh, factor here is the proper selection of case where we expect spontaneous tooth movement. The criteria of this case is, number one, the patient should be still growing. We need to have a favorable initial tooth inclination and angulation in order to have a spontaneous tooth movement. We should have no occlusal interferences to interfere with the tooth movement. And it's the excellent timing is just prayer for, for permanent tooth eruption. So that means within the stages of dental development, exfoliation of deciduous teeth, eruption of permanent teeth, this is the best time. After you choose the patient and you extract the tooth, you have to wait for six months. If nothing happens, that's it. That means nothing's gonna happen after that. Spontaneous tooth movement, the majority of this will happen within the first six months. Now, we come to something called serial extraction. And this is, uh, the last thing we're going to talk about for our lecture, and it is a hysteric approach. When we say hysteric, it means general dentists should not use it anymore. So what's the serial extraction? Well, this idea was found in the 1940s. And uh, the reason why we had it, because at that time, number of specialist orthodontists was low and demand of orthodontic treatment was increasing. So we had to ask the general dentist to step in to help with the treatment of orthodontic patients. And to do so, they cannot use the, the, the professional orthodontic appliances. They had to go for what we call serial extraction at the proper timing with the proper selection of patient and follow up spontaneous tooth movement. Um, again, we don't do this anymore because first of all, we have an excellent development of uh, uh, let's say more sophisticated orthodontic appliances, more sophisticated techniques. Uh, number two, nowadays we have increased number of orthodontic specialists, so uh, they can take over and they can treat such cases. The idea of serial extraction is to go is to shift the crowding from the labial segment gradually to the posterior segment, and then end up having uh, extracted one premolar in each side uh, on each side uh, of the treated arch if we treat both arches then uh, we we go with extraction of a premolar in each quadrant so the idea is to go with the extraction of c d and then four in that order so the patient should be uh, presented with a class one malocclusion moderate crowding and all permanent teeth should be present. Otherwise, you don't carry out this type of extraction. Okay. 
I'm going to give you an example. This is not the ideal case, but because we don't do this anymore, so I don't have lots of cases. As I said, the patient should be uh, presented with the class one malocclusion, moderate crowding, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And we should start by extracting C's, D's, and then fours. So as you could see here, we already have the four in the upper right quadrant already partially erupted. So this is a bit late for this patient. The lower fours fully erupted uh, already, and the lower left C already missing with with the crowding in this arch and impacted three. But yet. Uh, under our supervision, um, let's say late serial extraction was carried out. So what we had to do, in the upper arch, we extracted C, C, and D. In the lower arch, well, fours are already there, so we just extracted them. We followed the patient every six months until the uh, canines in the lower arch are erupting. We don't need to do anything else in the lower arch but to wait. But in the upper arch, as soon as the fours are fully erupted, we just go for extraction. So we extract the upper fours and we just follow up the patient. We don't do anything for the ease. They should exfoliate normally. OK, now for this patient, the upper left canine had a bit longer time, so we had to go for an OPG to just to make sure that everything's OK. And it was just there waiting to erupt. So everything was fine going as planned. And here's the patient at the end of the follow-up. Because this is a late serial extraction, uh, this is why we ended up having residual spaces. If the treatment timing was ideal, then uh, maybe we will end up with less spaces and, and uh, better results, let's say. So this is the patient having uh, crowding, and now we have residual spaces. Now, if the patient requires treatment, she will have a simple, orthodontic treatment and it's going to be short. If the patient is happy with her profile and with her teeth, no treatment should be applied at all. So this is finishing the topic of crowding and late lower incisor, a crowding specific case we talked about. Next time we're going to finish our special, case, special cases regarding spacing, displaced teeth, vertical discrepancies, transverse discrepancy and bimaxillary proclination. With regard to impaction, and other uh, treatment, this will be discussed in separate lectures. Thank you so much for listening.